Hi, everybody. Welcome today to my talk. My name is Lauren Sands. I am a senior technician at Safetyva Labs in Westfield, Massachusetts. But today, I'm actually presenting on my grad school work that I was so lucky to conduct at the University of Connecticut under Dr. Gerald Berkowitz. I don't have the clicker. And as said, the title of my talk is The Analysis of Hormonal Regulation of Promoter Activities of Cannabis Sativa Prenal Transferase 1 and 4. So the research goals for this, um, my grad school work, was to, one, develop a better understanding of the enzymes that produce cannabidiolic acid, CBGA, in terms of functionality, location, and importance in cannabis sativa. And in addition, we wanted to conduct studies involving hormone treatments to gather information regarding which hormone signaling pathways are actually involved in cannabinoid production. So cannabinoids are obviously produced in trichomes, and there's different types of trichomes on the cannabis plant, but we're specifically interested in the glandular stalk trichome. These are small hair-like projections that are made up of stalk and head tissue, most commonly found on leaves and flowers, on cannabis plants, and of course on unpollinated female flowers. These trichomes are the cannabinoid and terpene factories that we're also interested in. So the center image, you can see a quick little diagram of this trichome. You can see the base of a stalk and at the top, the secretory vesicles and cells. The top, this base, this is what we're interested in. So as I said, we're interested in this head of the glandular trichome. This contains the cannabinoids and the enzymes producing them, the enzyme that I mentioned that produces CBGA. This is the one we're interested in. So you can, you can see on the left a structural diagram up close that shows the different parts of the head of the glandular trichome. And then on the right, you can actually see the cannabinoid biosynthetic pathway written out showing you the top. The top on the right of this cannabinoid biosynthetic pathway shows you the plastid. And you can see in blue, it's connected to the diagram on the left. This shows the rosette of gland cells. This is the bottom of the head of the glandular trichome. So this contains the enzymes that produce CBGA, and CBGA is actually produced in the rosette at the base, and it is exported to the secretory reservoir, which you can see in red. This is indicated on the left and right. So you can see CBJ is produced in the base, exported to the reservoir, and we're trying to figure out why the enzyme is making CBGA. And you can see the star. This star indicates the CBGA synthase enzyme. CBGA synthase has been referred to as many different things in literature. It's been referred to as CBGA synthase, or GOT, geranial diphosphate olivatolate transferase, or in my case, PT4, prenal transferase 4. So we were just really interested in this CBGA synthase enzyme, and we're going to get more into that now. So the main reason why our lab decided to focus on this prenal transferase enzyme, CBGA synthase, is because we initially did a research study over the course of a flower per flowering period. We took, we took the flowers and we measured CBGA synthase, in this case PT4. We measured this gene expression over the course of the flowering period, as well as we took the cannabinoid content and we measured the CBGA in the plant. We saw at week four CBGA is peaking, and at week four this PT4 gene expression level, it's peaking as well, and then you can see a positive correlation increases, then decreases. and then. You can see on the right, we also did this with TH THCA and THCA synthase. We saw that THCA content's peaking at week six, but there's no positive correlation with THCA synthase. So we wanted to put less focus on this THCA synthase enzyme and more focus on the prenal transferase genes and these precursor enzymes. So we want to understand cannabinoid synthesis Look at the enzyme that's producing the cannabinoid that's needed for conversion towards endpoint cannabinoid synthesis. And as we know, CBGA is the mother of all cannabinoids. 
So CBGA synthase enzymes are prenyl transferases. These are membrane-bound enzymes localized to plant plastids. And in cannabis, we've identified 10 of them. And literature has actually pointed to the fact that PT4, this is the main CBGA synthase enzyme. However, all, some papers have referenced that PT1 is capable of producing CBGA, specifically in a patent done by Jonathan Page and his group in 2011. So there are, there's a lot of research, uh, literature review showing that, is it PT1 or is it PT4? So both have shown CBGA synthesis capability. However, yeast assays have revealed that PT4's only substrate is olivatolic acid, but PT1 is promiscuous. So PT1 is able to work with different substrates, olivatolic acid, olivatol, naringin, et cetera. PT1's affinity for this substrate, olivatolic acid, was shown to be, sorry, PT1 was 60 millimolar, while PT4 was 6.27 micromolar. So this is the affinity for this substrate. So PT4 was shown to have a 10,000 stronger affinity for this substrate, olivatolic acid. And lastly, when put into this yeast system, and when PT4 and PT1 were put into the yeast systems, and fed olivatolic acid, it was shown that PT4, in, ver in a variety of studies, PT4 was producing this CBGA while PT1 was showing little to no production of CBGA. So while literature points to PT4 being the main CBGA synthase enzyme, we figured with all this literature, maybe let's just look at both prenyl transferases. And to understand why these prenyl transferase genes that produce the enzymes are producing CBGA, we decided to look at their promoters. So promoters are the sequence upstream of the transcription start site that regulate DNA transcription and basically tell the gene whether to turn on, turn off, not work at all. And so these promoters have responsive elements throughout the region. And <clears throat> Promoters can be anywhere from 5,000 to 2,000 base pairs, upwards of that. And throughout these regions, there's responsive elements that respond to various stimuli. So stimuli such as hormones, specific transcription factor families, and more. So these regions are actually highly conserved across promoters. So it's really nice you can look at other organisms in these databases, such as place and plant care to see if maybe your promoter also has these putative responsive elements and maybe they also respond to these specific stimuli. And um, yeah, if they're responsive to these stimuli, this can activate an increased expression or repress the expression. So while there's all these different responsive elements that are contained in the promoter, we decided to focus solely on hormones. And hormones are chemicals produced by plants that regulate their growth, development, reproductive processes, et cetera. And actually hormones are known to be super involved in flowering in different plants, especially it's been shown in hops. So we've decided to focus on this uh, because hormones are definitely involved in secondary metabolite production and plants likely in cannabis. There haven't been too many studies on it, but it's pretty clear that they're involved in secondary metabolite production in cannabis. Um, so these hormone responsive elements, they are long stretches of DNA that are gonna bind to proteins that are activated as these hormones are released in the plant, as the hormone signaling pathways get active. And um, so these hormones, shown on the slide, of course there's many more in plants. These are the ones that we focused on for our studies. And so we use these databases, and these are, the, um, these are the hormones that we discovered are likely responsive in our promoters of prenyl transferase one and four. So we have ethylene, abscisic acid, gibberellin, cytokinin, salicylic acid, and auxin. And um, we predict that these hormones, not only a few of them are <clears throat> interacting with these prenyl transferase promoters, we predict that they're all working together in this orchestra that is cannabinoid synthesis in the plants. So we were able to clone the 600 base pairs upstream of the prenyl transferase 4 transcription start site, shown here on the screen. 
Um, we identified this using NCBI, and of course the responsive element databases provided us with these hormones uh, for prenatal transferase 4 as promoter. So these hormones, some of them might activate the promoter, some might not. They might work synergistically, antagonistically, or not at all. So we were actually able to clone this promoter, and we used it to examine the hormone. Of, we used it to examine, sorry, to examine the effects of hormone treatment on the promoters, as well as a, a variety of assays for promoter activity localization in cannabis plants using GUS assays. And we were also able to do this with prenal transferase one. We were actually able to clone more of the promoter of this gene. We got 1,500 base pairs. You can see on this screen, there's a little bit more responsive elements. We have gibberellin, salicylic acid, auxin, and abscisic acid. So we were able to clone these promoters from genomic DNA from cannabis sativa hemp in our lab at UConn. We cloned them and we inserted them into vectors either tagged with luciferase or GUS reporters. So these constructs with our promoters were utilized in dual luciferase assays or GUS assays. So luciferase assays report Luciferase reporter assays investigate whether stimuli can activate or repress transcription using the gene luciferase, and GUS assays are used for localization, and the functional GUS gene that's produced can, it makes blue coloration in the plant upon integration to the plant hormone, plant genome, sorry. So first we wanted to confirm the location of the greatest activity of prenatal transferase genes and promoters in the plant. On the left, you can see we performed quantitative PCR on our flowering plants in the sixth week of flowering, and we saw that the mRNA expression levels of both prenal transferase one and four were highly, uh, the gene activity was high, much higher in the flower and leaf compared to our root control. And after confirming the location of gene script, gene transcript location activity, we wanted to visualize these genes in the cannabis plants. So we used our promoter GUS constructs and we took cannabis seedlings and sugar leaves and we were able to visualize these promoters in, in the dark blue. You can see this is where the promoters are active in the plant. And so you can see seedlings on the left and sugar leaves on the right. So you can see in the sugar leaves, which are the leaves that form around the flowers as the plant matures, we saw greater activity in the dark blue for prenal transferase 4, and there's actually a really cool picture. This was our prenal transferase 4 promoter tagged with GUS. You can see in the sugar leaves, in the dark blue, in the trichomes, we were able to confirm that our promoter was very active in these regions, and not only did this confirm that this is where it's active, we also confirmed that these promoters were capable of driving different reporters. So to read the activation of our promoters in vitro, we utilize protoplasts, which are cells without cell walls. And without these cell walls, they can accept DNA and transiently express this DNA. And so using dual luciferase assays, we can measure this DNA expression. So we enzymatically isolated protoplasts and prepared them for transient expression of plasmids containing PT promoters driving the luciferase reporter. Overnight transfection and hormone treatments were completed following that of hormones at concentrations of 10 micromolar. And we also used, pop, we used negative and positive controls in this experiment. And the cells were then collected for five hours following this hormone treatment. And the protoplasts containing our plasmids were frozen and used in further duluciferase assays. And as you can see on the right here, this is an experiment done on a Arabidopsis. It shows that the promoters are active following hormone treatment in the five hours post-hormone treatment, and this is why we use these few hours afterwards. We measured this promoter activity with the luciferase assays, as said. And so in this case, we're investigating if our stimuli, this hormone, can activate our promoter to initiate transcription of this luciferase gene located downstream of this promoter. 
So this is actually using the luciferase gene found in fireflies and in sea pansies. And um, so their protoplasts are transfection with prenal transferase, firefly, luciferase constructs. That's our promoter of interest. And we also co-transfected it with a 35S constitutive promoter, which is tagged with our vanilla luciferase. So these frozen protoplasts that we collected previously are lysed, mixed with reagents, either luciferin for our firefly luciferase, our promoters of interest, or mixed with coella and, coella and terazine for our vanilla luciferase. So this reaction creates luminescence in our luminometer. This ratio is created, considered relative luminescence, and this, this directly correlates with the activation of the promoter following hormone treatment. <clears throat> so here are our results for pre prenal transferase four. We're presenting the response towards hormones, hormones that did result in promoter activation. We did see some hormones that did not uh, activate the promoter. That's all in the paper. We used methyl jasminate. This did not have a hormone responsive element predicted in the promoter. We saw no response from this. So these graphs, they show relative luminescence, the ratio created from firefly to vanilla luciferase in our, in our protoplasts following hormone treatment. So some hormones were administered as either a synthetic hormone or a precursor, depending on how these hormones exist in nature. So firstly, exogenous ethylene administered as one aminocyclopropane, one carboxylic acid. This is the precursor as ethylene is gaseous. Uh, led to significant promoter activity five hours past treatment. Exogenous hypsisic acid led to significant promoter activity at three and five hours past treatment. Exogenous gibberellin, administered as gibberellic acid three, led to significant promoter activ activation at hours three and five past treatment. And lastly, exogenous cytokinin, administered as transeatine riboside, led to significant promoter activ activation at hours three and five past treatment. So we went a little bit more in depth with salicylic acid's connection to prenal transferase four. We predicted that salicylic acid is likely involved, or very involved in cannabinoid synthesis because salicylic acid is a plant defense hormone and cannabinoids, among their many purposes, they are produced to play a role in defending the plant from pathogens, including insects, fungi, viruses, and bacteria. So in a previous experiment, we saw an increase in gene transcript levels in prenal transferase four following a soil drench treatment containing one millimolar of salicylic acid. So you can see it's a very tiny graph at the bottom. We actually saw a hundredfold increase in prenal transferase four gene expression three days post SA treatment. So we saw already that the gene transcript levels are affected by this hormone. So of course we expect it to be affected in the promoter. So we can see that CSPT4 promoter was activated at hours three and four past treatment for salicylic acid in PT4. And I actually decided to perform site-directed immunogenesis on this salicylic acid responsive element in the prenal transferase four promoter. So I was able to create point mutations in this response development shown in red. The red base pairs were switched. And I repeated this promoter hormone treatment with this mutated promoter and I then saw no response to salicylic acid. So we're essentially confirming that this putative responsive element is a bona fide cis acting element that is involved in salicylic acid signaling. So we think salicylic acid is a great hormone to look at in the future for cannabinoid synthesis and its effects on that. So while we saw many effects from prenal transferase four, we also looked at prenal transferase one, as I mentioned. We didn't see as great responses or higher responses, more hormones in the response of prenal transferase one's promoter. We saw, we did see a activation at hours one, three, and five for salicylic acid at uh, one, three, and five for auxin, and at hours three past treatment for abscisic acid. So there's different hormones affecting each prenal transferase promoter. There's different sets of hormones affecting each promoter. So we're thinking maybe there's different functionality in these prenal transferase genes. It's basically, it's giving a little bit more insight into how these different prenal transferase genes 
act in the cannabis plant. So I'll wrap this up really quickly. Um, our conclusions, so we think plant hormones are almost certainly very involved in cannabinoid synthesis and signaling pathways affecting the cannabinoid biosynthetic pathway. The hormone networks in cannabis, as seen in other plants, are very interconnected. We're seeing multiple hormones working on the same promoter. There's definitely needs to be more research involved in how, why, and when hormones are produced in the cannabis plant during flowering, how they're affecting prenatal transferase genes, and the effects on one hormone on another is really interesting. So as you can see, again, these hormones on the bottom left are ones that we saw response in, the promoters for these genes. Um, both promoters respond to salic acid and the cystic acid, and these hormone networks in plants have been shown to work together in many different plants or against each other. And lastly, um, we should conduct more studies on these promoters and hormones in the actual plant throughout flowering to understand how cannabinoid synthesis is actually happening. And this can help a lot in the future, one, if anybody ever decides to do growth promoter, growth regulators as hormones, and just understanding how cannabinoids are produced in the plant. It's really good to get a good understanding on how it's made, and so then we can further understand how cannabinoids are produced in the plant for medical purposes, growing purposes, and just to better understand our plants. Here's the sources for anybody interested in them, and yeah, thank you all. Thank you, CAMMED, Medicinal Genomics, and Advanced Nutrients. Great talk, Lauren. Um, Thanks. I, I've got uh, one question on the, the these hormone sequences that you were highlighting. Um, they're fairly short in sequence, which means if you scan the whole genome, you'll find them somewhat everywhere. Um, I, I noticed from some previous methylation sequencing that we've done before that, at least not on the parental transfer sporbine gene, but on the THC synthase gene, there's all types of weird methylation happening on the five prime uh, promoter of that, of that gene. And I noticed you made a mutation up there that introduced a CPG. Uh, is it possible that there's uh, an epigenetic component here of how these hormones are, are regulating these sequences? Like um, what's, what's the mechanism of the sequence site? Is, is there a protein that's like binding to it, you think, that's driving In the, the responsive elements? Yeah, the responsive elements. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I think I understand your question. <laughs> um, these short DNA binding sequences, they're specifically somehow binding to the transcription factors that are activated through the hormone signaling pathways. Now, obviously, I don't have this data with um, the types of hormone treatments you did, but I can yeah. share it through a bunch of um, bisulfite sequencing we did on plants before and after flowering, and I don't know, it might show some CPG uh, methylation that might be playing a role in those signatures. So I'll yeah. connect after. Yeah, um, actually, this data was accepted this morning for publication, so if anyone's interested, please check it out in scientific reports. <laughs>